Shalom. Today we're going to talk about the former rain and the latter rain as they are defined in Tanakh in the Bible and how that may or may not relate to what some prophesy to be a coming revival. The terms former rain and latter rain are according to the agricultural cycle. So even though we think of former as something being early and maybe we associate with the spring, in the agricultural cycle, the former, the early, is the rain that comes in the winter before you plant the crop. Former rain softens the ground and prepares the ground to receive the seed, and then it rains over the winter. The latter rain begins in the spring as the harvest is beginning to fill out the fruit, the grain, whatever the harvest is, to complete the ripening process for the harvest that begins in the spring and ends in the fall. So it might be a little counterintuitive to the way we think about it. Now there are prayers in the prayer book, in the Jewish liturgy. The prayer that you say beginning in the fall and ending in the spring, which would be from the end of Sukkot to the beginning of Passover, there is added a phrase, Meshiv Haruach Umorid HaGeshem, and it comes from a line in Psalm 147, verse 18. It means to cause the wind to blow and to cause the rain to fall. The spring to fall prayer was added in a later tradition, actually from the Sephardi tradition, and it is from Passover to the end of Sukkot, and that prayer, which was said in the same place, in place of this other line, morid hatal, which means to cause the dew to fall. There are words specifically for rain in Hebrew. The first is geshem. We see it in 1 Kings 17.7. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Another verb for rain which includes any kind of precipitation, really, is found in Genesis 2.5. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for Jehovah God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground, going back to the story of creation. However, the words for former rain and latter rain do not contain uh, either this geshem or this matar, either sense of rain or precipitation, they have their own words that are derived from different roots. So the former rain comes from a verb yore or yora. Yore or yora is a noun. It comes as an active participle. That means a present tense verb from the root yara. And we're going to find out what that means. We find this word in Deuteronomy 11:14 that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain, Yoreth, and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. Jeremiah 5:24. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear Jehovah our God that giveth rain, which is Geshem here, both the former, Yoreth, and the latter. In his season, he reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. In Hosea 6, 3, Then shall we know, if we follow on to know Jehovah, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, the geshem, the generalized word, as the latter, and the former rain, the yore, unto the earth. Hosea 10, 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek Jehovah till he come and rain righteousness upon you. This early rain of righteousness comes from the sky, which you can also find in Psalm 85. In another grammatical form, this word is more. If you know some Hebrew, you know that the mem can be the present tense, the participle indicator on a verb. Many present tense verbs will begin with the letter mem. So we're still in a noun form of the same root, yara. 
Joel 2.23 Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Jehovah your God, for he hath given you the former rain, Yoreh, moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So you see the latter rain comes in the first month. The first month is the month of Passover. Psalm 84, 6, who passing through valley of Baca make it a well. The rain, the early rain, also filleth the pools. Now you might know this word, moreh, if you ever went to Hebrew school. This is what we call the teacher, the moreh. And we see this word translated as teach in Exodus 4.12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. So there's a concept behind this yara, this verb of the former reign of teaching. Another meaning, Exodus 15.4. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he hath cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. Cast in the sense of being shot forth. And again, it is translated as shoot, as shooting an arrow. 1 Samuel 20:20. 20, 20. I will shoot thee three arrows on the side thereof, as though I shot at a mark. In 2 Chronicles 35:23. And the archers, the ones who are shooting, shot at King Josiah. And the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. So the literal material meaning of the verb yara is to shoot in a direction. This is the same root as the word for Torah. Torah, unfortunately, through translations, has become to be translated as law, but it probably would be better translated as instruction. God is giving the words out of his mouth. He's casting them forth. He's sending them forth like arrows, and they are the words that we are to take up and shape our life by these commandments that he gives. Where do we see this word Torah? Interestingly, in Genesis 26, 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, my instructions. Proverbs 1, 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law, the Torah, the teachings of thy mother. What's interesting is the opposite of shooting an arrow and hitting the mark is missing the mark, and this verb is translated as sin. The word is chet. Judges 20, verse 16. Among all this people, there were 700 chosen men left-handed, everyone who could sling stones at a hair breadth and not miss. They did not miss the mark. More typically, it's translated as sin, Genesis 26. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in thy integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me, from missing the mark. I have a mark of, of behavior that is good, and I don't want you to miss that mark. I don't want you to sin against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. In fact, the same concept carries over to Greek. The word amartia, to miss the mark, means to sin. This is the concept behind the former rain. It's the rain that goes out, it's cast forth from the sky, literally. But also the words of God are cast forth from his mouth to be instruction. This is the teaching rain. It softens the ground, it prepares the ground for the seed to come. The word for the latter rain is malkosh, Deuteronomy 11:14, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, the malkosh, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. Job 29:23, and they waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the latter rain. This word malkosh comes from or verb root, which means to gather, or it can also mean the later growth. We see in Job 24, 6. They reap everyone his corn in the field, and they gather the vintage of the wicked. Amos 7, 1. Thus hath the Lord, Jehovah, showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, 
and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowing. This root, lakash, is a cognate. It's a related root to the word lakat or leket, the gleaning. If you know the story of Ruth, we see this verb often in the story of Ruth. Genesis 31, 46. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. Leviticus 19.9 and when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. So the malkosh is the gathering, the gleaning, the end of the harvest. Now the final ingathering of Jehovah's people is seen in a shadow picture at Sukkot, Exodus 34:22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, and the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. That is Sukkot. The actual event is spoken of in Matthew twenty-four thirty-one. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now there is something which is called the latter rain movement, and we're going to talk about that. This comes from two scriptures, well actually more than two, we're just going to talk about two here and then we'll talk about another one. In Zechariah 10.1, Ask ye of Jehovah rain in the time of the latter rain, of the harvest rain, so Jehovah will make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. It was prophesied, it has been prophesied, that at this time Habakkuk 2.14 will be fulfilled. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Jehovah as the waters cover the sea. So there are actually two movements which are called the latter rain movement. The first was in the 1880s and the people believed that the end of the age had come. The movement was started by a Baptist preacher named Richard Sperling, and eventually it morphed into the Holiness Church and then into the Church of God, which we know today is based in Cleveland, Tennessee. The term latter rain itself indicates a belief that the last days have come upon the world in accordance with the verses in Joel 2, and we'll read those in a little bit, in which the term latter rain occurs. It's not the only place it occurs, but they took it as a, as a basis for what they saw happening. There was a prominent acceptance and encouragement of spirit baptism, speaking in tongues, prophecy, miracles, and other spiritual gifts. Similar revivals began taking place within this time frame. You might be familiar with things that happened in Topeka, Kansas, under Charles Fox Parham, also the Azusa Street in Los Angeles, which was under William Seymour. Together, these movements, which all began somewhere near the beginning of the 20th century, they became known as the outpouring of the latter rain. As I've said, they have developed and are pretty much conglomerated into what is called the Church of God. There was a later latter rain movement, which was actually named by its detractors, the latter rain movement. It began in 1948 in Saskatchewan, Canada, there was a spiritual outpouring, which people believed would come before the second coming of Yeshua. There was a man named George Warnock, who was the personal secretary to Ern Baxter. And some of you may have heard of Ern Baxter. Ern Baxter was an associate of William Branham, who is very well known within this second latter rain movement. Interestingly, George Warnock wrote a book in 1951 about the Feast of Ta Tabernacles, he discussed the role of living out the completion of God's feasts for Israel through perfection of the saints and their dominion over the earth. Unfortunately, this movement really went astray. They started typing down all the sermons and everything that was said, and it became put on a level with scripture and people were tucking these typed sermons into their Bible to include them with a level of scripture. Eventually this movement fell apart or merged with other similar charismatic movements. So looking at the scriptures in Joel 2 verses 23 through 29. Be glad then ye children of Zion and rejoice in Jehovah your God 
for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of Jehovah your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am Jehovah your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out my spirit. Now the concept of revival is when something which has been dead is brought back to life. These verses in Joel are actually quoted by Peter at the time of Pentecost, at the time of Shavuot. Tabernacles at the end of the agricultural year shows the final ingathering. Whether the final ingathering is a revival where people who have been perhaps nominal believers come to life in the spirit of Jehovah, or whether that ingathering is the final ingathering when Yeshua brings all his people together to be with him forever, is not the subject of this video. The important thing we want to see here is that there will be no ingathering, there will be no revival, there will be no final harvest unless the former rain, the teaching rain, comes first. I thank you for your time. As always, Tasim et inayim al Keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.